All right, let's open up the Bible to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And we're going to start off by looking at several verses, if that's all right. Luke chapter 2 and verse 46. Isn't it nice to sing about Beulah Land? It's nice to sing about those things for a while, right? You've been stuck in the world for the entire week. It's a nice way to kind of transport the mind. Set your affections on things above. On that highest mount I stand. It's kind of nice to think about that, right? Luke chapter 2 and verse 46. I like the song before it as well. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. You ever tried that? Have you ever tried that? Counting all the blessings? That's a full-time job. It's wonderful. The Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Bless His holy name. Isn't that a wonderful verse? Now Luke chapter 2, verse 46. These verses, you're going to see the connection as we go. And we're going to jump around. Luke here, Matthew there, John there, all over. But you'll see where we're going with this. As you guys say, now, now. Whatever that means. Luke 2, verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days, they found Him. Mary and Joseph had lost Jesus. Now, I know he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> I guess that applies after he's 12. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Mary has been entrusted with the Son of the living God and she lost him. You talk about a nervous feeling. <laughs> right? The angel said, the child born of you is the Holy One. He, he's the highest. He's the Son of God. Oh dear, where did I put him? And it came to pass, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting, watch these three words, in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Where do we find him? In the temple, <clears throat> and more specifically, in the midst, in the middle. I like the Afrikaans, middle pint. I used the middle pint. Right there in the very center of it all. That's awesome. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 20. This will be a small exercise in finding different verses in the Bible. Matthew 18, verse 20. Jesus says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I, next three words, in the midst of them. I like that. Two or three get gathered, and they're doing it the way Jesus told them to do it, in His name. He's right there in the midst. Wonderful. Wonderful. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse number 18. What a lovely promise. Two or three are gathered together in my name and he'll be in the midst. Isn't it a strange thought that we don't have to ask God to show up? He already said he would. You know what that tells me? We just need to enjoy the fact that he's here. That he is in the midst. Isn't that a lovely thought? John 19 verse 18. Now we're speaking of Golgotha. And it says, that's where they crucified him. And two other with him on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst. Even when we get to the cross and the people hate him, away with him, crucify him. You know where they put him? Right in the middle. Right in the middle. It just makes sense to have Jesus in the midst. Now, you know the old saying, you can't keep a good man down. So they killed him, then they buried him. But on the third day, he rose again. He is the very definition of a good man. <laughs> and you can't keep him down. So John chapter 20, verse 19. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, this is resurrection morning, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Right where he should be. Right there in the middle. Eight days later, verse 26. Verse 26. And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in 
the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Isn't that great? Every time we turn around, there's Jesus right in the middle of it all. I think you're starting to see the theme of my sermon. Jesus in the midst. Come back to Luke. Just a, one book back, Luke 24. Luke 24 and verse number 36. This is also speaking of the time when Jesus rose from the dead. So this matches John 20, verse 19, for those of you that are keeping score on that. Luke 24, 36, he says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. you say, why did you show me that? It's the same thing. I want you to see that John noted it, and Luke also noted it. They both found it an interesting and integral part of the story that Jesus didn't just show up and stand in a corner. He didn't show up and just file in with everybody else and became one of the queue. He stood right in the middle of it all. Get Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. God's coffee shop. Hebrews chapter 2. That's an old and tired joke by this point, but it works. Hebrews. Some of you, after the service, you'll get it, right? <laughs> what does this have to do with coffee? But you're paying attention because I said coffee, right? <laughs> Hebrews 2, verse 12. Hebrews 2, verse 12. This is speaking of a prophecy that Jesus has fulfilled and is fulfilling. Hebrews 2, and verse 12. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church... Will I sing praise unto thee? Do you see right in the middle of the verse, he says, in the midst of the church. In the midst of the church. Now, if I was you, here's where I would quietly, so I don't disturb anyone, just get up and move closer to the middle. <laughs> you folks sitting right down there in the middle, perfect. Right? I don't know if you planned it. I don't know if you had Hebrews 2.12 in mind when you did it, but he said, I'll be right there in the middle right there in the middle, and I will sing praise unto thee. Isn't that, isn't that lovely when you think about the song service? As we lift our voices in praise to God, He says, ooh, I want to do that. And He comes right there in the midst of His brethren and says, let's all praise God together. Isn't that wonderful? Right there in the midst. Let's come to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Guess what we're going to see here? <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. John, he is now seeing a heavenly vision. He has seen the Lord Jesus not in his human form as John had previously known him, but he's seen him in his resurrected, glorified, ascended form as he appears this moment in heaven. In verse 13. And in the midst, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, and so forth. Do you see that the seven candlesticks, you know what those are, right? Verse 20 says they are the churches, the seven churches mentioned in Revelation, and Jesus is right there in the middle of it all, Jesus in the midst. In the midst. Right where he should be. I think if the church has made any mistake, it's taking Jesus out of its midst. He should be the focal point. He should be the middle bent. He should be where our attention is gathered. Look at Revelation 5, verse number 6. Now John has been taken to heaven. He has entered the spiritual realm. It says in in chapter 4, verse 2, immediately he was in the Spirit. He has left the natural realm, he's in the spiritual realm, and he's transported to heaven, and he's seen heaven. Wouldn't that be wonderful if it happened right now? Now. I, one of these days, that's going to work. Now. If we were to be transported this moment to heaven, this is what we would see. Oh, Revelation 5, verse 6, and it says, And I beheld... And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and 
in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. From Him all life, all being flows. And all of heaven's attention is gathered to the middle bent, to the very center. What is the center of everything in the midst of the throne? The entire platform where the throne sits. In the midst of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, where is everybody focused? Everybody has their eyes turned to the Lamb. And they notice that it is a Lamb that has been slain. They are seeing what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us as He was in the midst of those two thieves. I want to preach to you. I bet you can tell me the title of my sermon. <laughs> Jesus in the midst. All we want to do today is take a long look at Him in the middle of of everything we do, of everything we know, and I guarantee it will help make much more sense out of everything there is. Would you join me in prayer? Let's bow our heads. Father, please help us this morning. Our, our desire is to have Jesus in the midst of our attention. You've already promised that, that He would be in our midst. Lord, You said that You would be here during our song service and sing praise along with us. Lord, now we want to simply recognize that. We want to enjoy that. We want to turn our eyes upon You. Please, Lord, help us today to worship You in spirit and in truth. Thank You for this privilege, this opportunity to brag about You. Would You please help me to do it? In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Can you take your Bibles to John chapter 1, please? <clears throat> Sorry, John chapter 1. And verse number one, and the first place I want to look for Jesus in the midst of is nature. Nature. Nature makes sense if Jesus is in the midst. Nature makes sense if Jesus is in the midst. Let me explain that further. John 1 and verse number one, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everybody knows who the Word is, yes? Before Jesus was known as Jesus, He was known as the Word, the Logos, the reason, the rationality. It says in verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. In verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. You take Jesus out of the context of nature and nature falls apart. Nature doesn't make sense without a nature maker. We have to have a creator to go along with the creation. And without the creator in the midst of it, it just loses some of its effect. How can we have something instead of nothing unless something said there should be something? Isn't it... Interesting that when we refer to what is created, we call it a universe. Isn't that something that even the atheists call it a universe? The scientists call it a universe. Do you know what the word universe is? Uni, one, verse, word. One word. The word. When we focus on Jesus in the midst of nature, then it makes sense how instead of, instead of chaos, we have order. Why? Because these... Listen, nature didn't make itself. Nature didn't produce itself through natural laws. Who wrote the laws of nature? If, 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 if there are natural laws, somebody had to write those laws. And having a creator in the midst of nature helps us understand how such beauty, how such order came to be. It all started not with a something, but with a someone. If you go back in Genesis 1, you say, but I want to find Jesus in there. And God said, let there be. And God said, it was a word that spoke it into existence. And Jesus is that word. Many people have asked me, what about the heathen that have never heard? What about people that don't have a Bible? Can I transport you back 2,000 years ago? And let's just pretend, because many people were 2,000 years ago, illiterate. 
You can't read, you can't write, you've never been in a church, you've never visited a synagogue, you've never heard the Bible, read it, you don't even know a Bible exists. And you see this man walking down the roads of Galilee and a blind man sitting by the wayside. And this blind, blind man cries out, Please, son of David, have mercy on me. And this, this man that you're watching, he, he lays his hand on that man, and this man who's never seen, boom, the eyes are opened. If you're that heathen that have never heard, what are you going to think of that man? You're going to think, wow, he has the ability to take a blind eye and make it a seeing eye. He goes to the deaf man and he opens that man's ears. He goes to the man that can't talk right and he, gives, he looses that man's tongue and he can speak right. This same man, if you look a little farther into his ministry, let's just pretend, right, you're watching it happen. There's a violent storm blowing, and the waves are kicking up, and the disciples, many of them professional fishermen, are panicking. You know it's bad when professional fishermen start to panic. They've been through a storm or two. And they say, we're all going to die, and here comes Jesus walking on the water. That's better than any superhero movie you'll ever watch. He's walking on the water. What are you going to start to think? You're going to start to think, whoever this guy is, he has power over nature. He can take the human body and manipulate it and take a, a, a damaged eye and cause it to see. He can take a deaf ear and open it up. He can take that tongue that is twisted and make it speak plainly. This guy can make the water congeal under his feet as he walks. This, this man is not like the rest of us. He's not from nature. He's over nature. This same man, he can sit down with five loaves of bread and two fishes and he can feed 5,000 families with it. This man, he is not constrained by the laws of nature. He is the one who wrote the laws of nature. You would start to get the idea... That whoever I'm watching here, whoever this is, he makes sense. He, he tells me where nature came from. If he can come down and tell nature what to do, standing on the side of a boat, oh, I would love, I would love to watch that. I'm, when I get to heaven, I'm going to rent this from the DVD store. The, I'm going to rent the, rent, the, rent the show where Jesus stands on the side of the boat and the disciples are saying, Master, Master, don't you care that we're, we're all going to die? And he puts his foot on one side and he says, hey, 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 calm down. Peace, be still. And all the winds and waves die down. Man, I have just met the nature maker. If I am that heathen that's never heard and I'm wondering, where did it all come from? Who put all this together? Why is there something other than nothing? I know where to find answers for that now. If I put Jesus in the middle of nature, now it makes sense. I can go and ask Him where it all came from. You know, we know that Jesus raised the dead, right? We know that. The Bible tells us that. He has so much power over nature that He can not only organize it, but then He, he invigorates it. He gives it life. And at any time, if life gets away from somebody, He can put the life right back in them. Did you know that there's one thing Jesus never did in His ministry? Something I've done that Jesus has never done. Jesus never preached a funeral. Did you know that? He never preached a funeral. I've preached funerals. He never preached a funeral because when He showed up, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. When He showed up, people just raised up out of the dead. <laughs> he never preached a funeral. You go study it in your Bible. Every time a funeral procession passed by Jesus, the dead man got up. Every time Jesus was invited to a funeral, Lazarus, come forth. Up they come. This one, this Jesus, He has pow not only power over nature, He makes sense of nature. He tells me that it must have come from someone. Someone has power over it. Nature is not in control of itself. It is controlled by someone else. He is before all things, the Bible says, and by Him all things consist. It all stays together because He told it to. He told it to. How many of you remember this verse? The heavens declare the glory of... Now, you don't sound like you believe it that much. Is that God with a little g? <laughs> I think the way you said it, it was a, it was a, a, wee, little, a wee little God. <laughs> the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. 
You take God, you take God manifest in the flesh, Jesus, you take him out of it, and what do we have? The heavens declare what? They declare nothing. They just say we're here because we're here and we have no idea why we're here. We're here because we just accidentally are. Well, that's not much of a message. That doesn't make sense. Tell me why you're here. Ask the heavens, why are you here? And they'll say, let me tell you all about my maker. Let me tell you how wonderful, how beautiful he is. Let me tell you how ordered he is. Let me tell you about his plan and how it just keeps working and working and working. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. You take, you take Jesus out of the midst of nature and we no longer have those hands holding it all together. We no, long, we no longer have anybody declaring the glory of God. The next verse says, Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. It utters speech every day. Look around in nature. You know what? It, it's talking to you. It's saying, look at who made me. Look at who made me. Look at how wonderfully, look at the diversity. Look at the beauty. Look at the order. Look at how intelligent this is. Night unto night showeth knowledge. It doesn't matter if the sun is shining or the moon's reflecting that light. Nature has something to say about its maker. Take the maker out of nature and then nature's message makes no sense. You put Jesus in the midst of nature and wow, nature can tell you a story about the one who made it. Can I ask you to come to Luke 24? You should be right there, Luke 24, verse 44. Maybe just look up on your page, that's what I have to do. Luke 24, verse 44. And the next place I want to see Jesus in the midst of is in the midst of your Bible. He should be in the midst of your Bible. Scripture, let me say, Scripture makes sense when Jesus is in the midst of it. When you view the Bible through the lenses of Jesus... The Bible becomes a very different book, a very interesting, very amazing book. You take Jesus out of the midst of your Bible. What a boring book. Oh, it's a dreadfully slow, boring, monotonous book. You say, oh, that's blasphemy. No, 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 no. I got Jesus in the midst. That changes everything. When Jesus rose from the dead, of course, the disciples struggled to believe that it was actually Him. That's a great point. I love that point too. He ate in front of them. He offered them to touch his body to see if it was real and not just a ghost. And then what really convinced them is Luke 24, verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Did you know the Old Testament has three parts? Jesus covers them all right here. The Psalms, what we might call the writings. The prophets, Isaiah and onward. The law, the Torah, the first five books. Jesus said, guys, sit down. Let me, let's have a Bible study. You see this story here in Moses? You, you see in Exodus here? You see this in Genesis? That's me. You see this in Leviticus? Anybody ever read Leviticus? Any brave souls out there? Anybody ever got discouraged reading Leviticus thinking, why am I reading Leviticus? What good comes from this? Who cares who has leprosy? I'm not going to make any bread offerings. Why am I reading this? Did you know that popcorn is in, Luke, in Leviticus chapter 2? Popcorn. There's a Bible verse about popcorn. And it has nothing to do with steerkinicor. <laughs> And, and, and the temptation will come up, why am I reading this? And then Jesus sits him down and says, listen guys, watch this, Leviticus, you see this offering? Yeah, that's a picture of me. Wait a minute, are you saying that you're a sacrifice? Yep, yep, that's what I'm saying. Do you see me here? See where it says sin offering? That's me. Whoa. You mean Leviticus 6 is all about you? Sure is. Wait a minute, Leviticus 3 talks about a peace offering. Yep, I can give you peace with God, that's about me. Whoa. Well, no, what about this one? The prophet like unto Moses. That's me. He turned water to blood. I turned it to wine. He had power over the serpent. I could cast out devils. 
He could heal the leprous hand, the, the Napoleon trick, you know, to foom, foom, leprosy, foom, foom, no leprosy. He could heal, I could heal. They went, you, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean every Sabbath when we went to Sabbath school and the teacher taught us all these boring stories from the book of Genesis and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that was all you? All me. And they said, oh my goodness, that is truly amazing. In verse 45, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. You have to see Jesus throughout it in order for it to make sense. You know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3? He said, these Old Testament Jews, when they re read the Bible, there's a veil over their heart. They, they don't see what it's all about until their heart turns to Christ. Then the veil is taken away and then they get it and they say, now we see what all these prophecies are about. Now we can see Jesus throughout this thing. You think about Isaac carrying that wood up a mountain as his father is told to sacrifice the son whom he loves. Don't you see Jesus in that? Don't you see God's only beloved, His only begotten Son going up that mountain carrying that wood who's going to lay down His life as a sacrifice? That's Genesis 22. When we read about the fiery serpents biting the Israelites and they're dropping dead one after the other and then Moses is commanded, put a brazen serpent on a pole and if anybody looks to that serpent, they'll live. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We're all bitten by the, by the fiery serpent of sin. And because of sin, we die. But Jesus was hung on that old rugged cross. And if we look to that, we live. That's the gospel according to Numbers 21. <laughs> Who would have thought to look there? Take a lamb, keep it in the house four days, and on that Passover night, you slaughter the lamb. Make sure that you eat it before the night is over and take the blood and put some of it on the top of the doorpost, some of it on the sides. Put the blood in three places. Why? There's three crosses. Make sure you got some blood in the midst. And if your house is covered by the blood, that death angel will pass over you. Well, that's just a boring story about Jewish history. Oh, but the New Testament says Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And if your soul is covered in the blood, and when death comes looking for you, listen, you cannot be touched of the second death. You need not face the destruction of the wrath of God because you're covered in the blood. Brother, sister, everywhere we look, if we see Jesus in the midst of it, the Bible is an amazing book. An amazing book. I often get this question, Brother Mike, can you please recommend a good commentary for the Bible? I'm not against commentaries. I like them. I like them. Use commentaries. Good ones. The best, com the best commentary you'll ever find on the Bible is putting Jesus right in the middle of it. So I don't understand that passage. Try this. Stick Jesus right in the middle of the story and see what that does for it. Say, Brother Mike, will that answer every Bible question I have? No, but boy, you'll enjoy reading it more. <laughs> and you'll have Jesus in the midst. You can't go wrong there. Oh, look for Jesus on every page. Can I show you another place? Ephesians 5, please. Ephesians 5. Jesus in the midst. What a lovely thought. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. And verse number 22. You put Jesus in the middle of nature and it makes sense. You put Jesus in the middle of Scripture, make Him the middle pint, and it makes sense. The next place I think we need to make sure we have Jesus in the midst of is our homes. Family makes sense if Jesus is in the midst. Your home, your household is going to make so much more sense be so less chaotic if you have Jesus in the midst. In Ephesians 5, verse 22, now watch how this works. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now watch the last part. As unto the Lord. Paul's going to teach a lesson for the wives and how they should treat their husbands, how they should act there. And you know what he links it to? Just like you would the Lord. He puts the Lord right in the middle of the lesson. So I want to be a better wife. Study the life of Jesus. 
Put him in the midst of what you're doing. See if that doesn't help. He said, but it tells me to submit. Jesus is the Lord. He's the master. What does he know about submission? While he was on the earth, he had to submit to the Father. Perfect example. He had to submit to a loving, gracious Father. He knows how to submit. He knows what that command is all about. Put him in the midst and it'll help. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Buy them lots of jewelry. And Oh, that's not in there. I'm sorry. Husbands, love your wives. Even, <laughs> my wife wrote a note in there. I'm sorry. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. Husbands, love your wives even as... And look who he points to. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He says, you want to have a good marriage? Put Jesus right in the middle of it. Wives, treat your husbands this way. Where do I learn? Jesus. Husbands, love them right. How do I do it? Jesus. So Brother Mike, please help me with my children. Because that's the third part of that little trinity, right? You got mom, dad, and then you got the children. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, listen, 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 Kafali. Isn't that a great line? Listen, Kafali. Children, look here. Where are the children? Children, you're my child. Look here. <laughs> children, they're not looking. Children, hey, I'm talking to you. <laughs> children, okay. Young at heart, <laughs> there's some children. <laughs> you're all, yes. Children, obey your parents. But look at the next phrase. In the Lord. For this is right. Notice how Paul keeps that very simple and very short because children aren't going to listen that long. <laughs> children, let me make it quick. Obey your parents. <laughs> In the Lord. In the Lord. Where do I learn about obedience? Go right to Jesus. How do I know which things to obey? Because maybe mom and dad won't tell me the right thing all the time. Make sure that what mom and dad is saying follows along with what the Lord is saying, it all revolves around Him. And when Jesus is in the midst of that home, you can't have a happier home. You can't have a happier home with Jesus in the midst. I say, but Brother Mike, in my home, it's not just husbands and wives and children. There's also the father aspect, right? So verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Right there again. Every time Paul mentions the home, he points you to the Lord. Focus on Him. Eyes on Him. Put Him in the midst. Make everything revolve around the Lord Jesus. You can't go wrong. We sing the song, don't we? Oh, give us homes built firm upon the Savior, where Christ is head and counselor and guide, where every child is taught His love and favor and gives his heart to Christ the crucified. How sweet to know that though his footsteps waver, his faithful Lord is walking by his side. Oh, give us homes. Oh, give us homes. If you were here last week, you heard me talk about the threes of the Bible and how God is irreducibly complex. One God in three persons. That's his as far down as you can break that equation. And what eternally existed within the Trinity itself is this perfect love, one person to the next within the Godhead. And then that same love, that same Trinitarian love, if I can say it that way, shared amongst the three persons of the Godhead is now supposed to be manifested in our homes so that when you have the man, you have the woman, and you have the children, the children love the dad, the dad loves the mom, the mom loves the children, the children love the mom, the mom loves the dad, and it just goes around in this perfect love. Where do we learn it? With Jesus in the midst. If we would learn to all keep our eyes on Him. Brother Mike, my wife's a problem. My husband doesn't do this. My children do that. Oh, point him to Jesus as best you can because he's going to fix that a whole lot better than you can. Keep Jesus in the midst. One last place, Revelation 4. Revelation 4, verse 11. 
And the last place I want to draw your attention to, where Jesus needs to be in the midst. Revelation 4 verse 11, He needs to be in the midst of your life. Your personal, individual existence. If you want to orient your life correctly. People, I I don't understand where this verbiage comes from, but I hear it a lot. I need to define myself. I need to find myself. It's not that hard. (laughs) I'm right here. (laughs) Every time I stub my toe, I find myself. (laughs) I'm right here. I I may not understand that that well, but what I think people are trying to say when they say that is they want to find a purpose in life. Why am I here? What's this all about? It's a good question. Revelation 4 verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things. Now we're back to the nature. But look at the next thing. And for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Why is anything here? For God's pleasure. Why are you here? For God's pleasure. Specifically in this passage, they're pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why did He make me? He made me to enjoy me. He wanted to, he wanted to find pleasure in me. That defines me now. That gives my life purpose and meaning. That if I am enjoying Him and He is enjoying me, I am fulfilling my created purpose. I have reached the highest achievement that a created being can achieve. I have hit the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. I'm doing what He made me to do. I'm making Him happy. How do I do that? I I have to view my life with Jesus right in the middle of it. Anything less, anything out of balance, left of center, right of center, a little too late, anything less than Him right in the middle, everything revolving around Him, life is going to be out of balance and it's not going to feel right. You're not going to have peace. You're not going to be satisfied until you put Him right in the middle. Listen, not in a fearful way, not in an anxious, stressed out manner. Oh, if I don't get it just right, He's going to get me. No, 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 no. Not at all. He says, listen, understand why I want to be in the middle. I want to be in the middle. So that you can be happy. I can be happy. We can enjoy one another exactly the way with all the benefits that come with, with, with me being in your life. I want that for you. I want that abundant life for you. Are we, are we okay with that term? You don't think I'm Pentecostal if I say it? Are we okay with that? Pentecostals don't own the abundant life. Jesus owns that. Right? He said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. Can, can I tell you what comes with the abundant life? Watch. You're going to love this. You need to smile more. <laughs> Big goofy grins. Try it. Some of you can't even try it. Shame. There, see, it's working. The longer we dwell on it, the better it gets. <laughs> All they have to do is, is, is pan the crowd and, and, and smiles pop up. Listen, and this is just looking at me smile. This, this is making you smile. <laughs> what does that say about you? <laughs> Imagine if you got an eye full of Jesus. Imagine if He became the focus. Imagine if you were to just turn your eyes upon Him for, for a span of time. Imagine the smile that would come across your heart. There is no sweeter place. There is no better vacation. There isn't a better memory to make than the memories you make by putting Jesus right in the middle of what you're doing. Say, Brother Mike, how can I learn to please Him? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Guess where I'm going to show you that answer? We're going to look right at Jesus. What's the first thing that happened after Jesus was baptized? The Father spoke from heaven. What did the Father say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well, what? Pleased. 
He looked down and said, man, I'm happy with that, with that guy right there. Look at that. That's my son. I'm so happy with him. I am not just pleased, well pleased. I don't know how much better that can be, but it's better. I'm well pleased. Now, watch this. You say, but Brother Mike, Jesus, you know, he's preaching. He's doing miracles, walking on the water. You just told us all that you're raising the dead. I'm not that. How could he be pleased with me? Ooh, time out. When did God say that? Before or after the miracles? Before. Jesus hadn't preached one word. He hadn't performed one miracle yet. Not one. You say, what was he doing? People say this all the time, that from the age of 12 to the age of 30, we don't know what Jesus did. Ah, nonsense. Read your Bible. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. He was a carpenter. Right? He was a carpenter. I know what he did. He went to work every day. And then when he was done work, and he went home. And you know what he did the day after that? He went back to work. Sound familiar? <laughs> Ringing true to anybody? When he was growing up, guess where he went? School. Isn't that shocking? He went to school. Now, if, it was, if you're Jesus, that's got to be boring, right? Because he's the maker of everything, and he's sitting there listening to this teacher talk about science. He's like, man, if you only knew. <laughs> Mathematics, <laughs> calculus for who? <laughs> he knows all of this stuff, right? Jesus went to school. He went to work. Did you know that he, that he enjoyed his family? He said, now wait a minute, Brother Mike, how do you know that? I read that his brothers and sisters got offended at him after he started his ministry. Once he started telling everybody, listen, I'm not just the son of Mary, I'm the son of God. Then his brothers and sisters said, well, man, come on now. If they got offended at that, that means they weren't offended before. They were getting along. So much so that when Jesus started his ministry, his mom was right there with him at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Remember that? Jesus, they have no wine. Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Now, you've got to have a good relationship with your mom and I call her woman. <laughs> Woo, that wouldn't work in our culture, would it? Unless your ma says something, hey, hey, son, hey, woman, not no, ooh, you better duck, you better duck, you better run, booty run. <laughs> Isn't that interesting that Mary was right there and then at the cross you see Mary again. And Jesus is making sure that Mary's taken care of. Jesus, he had a relationship with his family. He went to work. He went to school. Oh, by the way, he went to the synagogue in between 12 and 30. Yeah, he did. Because in Luke 4, it says he was at the synagogue doing what he had always been doing. He stood up for to read, and he took the Scripture. This was part of a synagogue service, and he would read the Scripture. That was not the first time he did that. He had been doing that. He went to church. He went to work. He had a good relationship with his family, and he had a godly testimony. I know that. So how do you know that? When Jesus stood up in Matthew 5 and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. How could he say that if he hadn't been doing it? Because nobody, nobody, when he said, You've read an old time, this, 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 but I say unto you, nobody said, No, no, you hypocrite. You haven't been living that. Now how dare you preach to us? You know what they all said? This man speaks with authority. Not like one of the scribes. He backs up what he's saying. Oh, I know a lot about Jesus from 12 to 30. Before he ever became a preacher, before he ever did any miracles, God said, I am well pleased with him. You don't have to become a preacher. You don't have to be a missionary to hear God speak in your heart and say, I'm well pleased with you. You know what you need to do? Just keep the Lord right there in the middle of what you're doing. You know what Jesus said at the age of 12? I must be about my father's business. You know what Jesus did? He had his father right there in the midst of his life. He says, I'm focusing on that at 12. Moms, dads, now you got some firepower for your 12-year-olds. <laughs> Jesus did it at 12. Come on, now follow. <laughs> Jesus kept God right there in the midst. That's our example. We keep Jesus in the midst. I go to work. What am I going to do at work? I'm going to work my job in a way that will be pleasing to God. 
And I should not think that I am any less than the preacher or the missionary or somebody called to do something specific. This is what God's given me to do. And I'm going to do it unto the Lord and not unto men. And I'm going to go home and be a good dad. And I'm going to try to turn the eyes of my family to Jesus. And I'm going to treat my wife as Christ loves the church. And that man, that mama, that child that keeps Jesus in the midst can have a life that is fulfilling. Why? We're created for His pleasure. What pleases Him? God told us what pleases Him. A God-centric life. Somebody keeping Jesus right in the midst. I'd like to finish in John 17. Can I show you just a verse here? A couple verses. John 17. John 17, verse 3. Jesus is marching towards the cross. And in His final moments, before He's arrested, before the Garden of Gethsemane, John 17, 3. He prays this, actually. In John 17, 3, He says, This is life eternal. Have you ever heard anybody say, This is the life? Right? The way Jesus says it is, This is life eternal. <laughs> this is it. This is the whole shebang. This is what it's all about. This is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. Jesus is speaking to the Father, and He says, Father, this is what it's all about. This is what my existence coming into this world, my human existence, this is what it's all for, is so that these people can know You and enjoy You. Look at verse 26 at the end of the chapter. He says, and I have declared unto them thy name. And will declare it. I'm not done yet. He says, until my dying breath, and literally with his dying breath, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. With his dying breath, he's still talking about the Father. I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. Now what does that mean? Does that mean Jesus stood around saying, God's name is Jehovah, God's name is Jehovah, God's name is Jehovah? He didn't do that. That would get very boring. <laughs> he didn't do that. You know what he did? Over and over, day after day, he would tell the disciples how great God is. He says, come around, let me tell you not just what his name is, but everything that goes with that name. The Lord, the Lord God, he's merciful, he's gracious, he's plenteous in mercy, he's long-suffering, he is love, and just goes on and on and on about how wonderful a God we have. Why would Jesus do that to help the disciples fall deeply and deeper in love with Him? Keeping the Father right in the midst of their attention. I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. We'll pause right there. The love that the Father has for the Son. What does the Son want? What does Jesus want? He wants that love to be in you. That relationship that Jesus enjoyed with God the Father, that love that He felt, He wants you to feel that between you and Him. Say it's impossible. Why would He pray it then? I say it is. How can we achieve it? Keeping Him right in the midst. So how do you know? Look at the last phrase. He says at the, at the end of the verse, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, comma, and I in them. Guess where He's at? Right in the midst. He said, here's my goal. I want to be in them. Right in in the midst. That's how we achieve this fulfilling life. You put Jesus in the middle of nature, it makes perfect sense. We can see there's a creator, he has power over it. Put him in the middle of your Bible, it makes perfect sense. All those prophecies point to him, all those pictures are about him. You put him in the middle of your home, it'll make so much more sense. It'll create order where there was chaos. 
You put him in the midst of your life. You allow Jesus to become your definition. Don't worry about defining yourself. He must increase. You must decrease. Just put him in the midst and watch how life begins to fall into place. How it all, listen, he was before all things and by him all things consist. That is, they stay together and they work properly. If he is in the midst, it works by him. His desire is to love you with the utmost love. And that only happens when he is in the midst. I in them. Let's all stand if you would please. Heads bowed and eyes closed, please, just for a few moments. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Caleb will play something softly. Today, I have tried to put Jesus in the middle of every point. My goal, as feeble as my abilities are, my goal was to brag about Him today. That was my goal. I wanted to tell you today how great He makes nature, the Bible, your home, your life. If for whatever reason, life has possibly knocked you off center a little bit, and Jesus isn't the middle bent, this might be a good time to just get realigned, get Him back in the midst in the midst did you hear it today you don't have to be a preacher you don't have to pastor a church you don't have to go to Russia you don't even have to attend Bible school you can have all of this keeping Him in the midst. You can love Him, have a godly home, have a fulfilling life if you'll just focus on Him. Learn from Him. Enjoy Him. Did you hear that? Enjoy Him. He made you for His pleasure. That, that, that indicates He enjoys you. Let Him do that. Enjoy Him back. Go home today and count your blessings. You know what you'll find? The biggest blessings you have, Jesus is right in the middle of all of them. The happiest my home has ever been is when we were, as a group, seeking the Lord. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's the best our church will ever be, is when we're focused on that, on, on Him, on seeking Him intently. It'll make sense out of all we do. At some point today, take a walk outside. Out, remember that? Remember where outside is? Outside the door, outside that window that you look out of, go outside. Look around at what God has made. Bask in the glory of His creation. And say, my God, how great Thou art. See if that song doesn't pop up in your heart. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and, he and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. Your whole soul just cries out, My God, how great Thou art. Tonight when the stars come out, just look up and remember that God flung them all into existence. And that's the one that lives inside of you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? I say it doesn't get better than that. Jesus in the midst. Lord, what a, what a privilege. Thank you for being in our midst this morning. Lord, 
Why is it that we don't fall to our face and say, My Lord and my God? Why is it we don't marvel? Why is it we don't adore you more? God, help us. Lord, help us to keep you in the midst. Oh, this world just throws so much at us, Lord. We need you in the middle of all we do. You make sense out of why we have a job. You make sense out of why we study like we do at school. You give us purpose. You're the reason. To me, to live is Christ. Please help us, God. Oh, and Lord, there's someone here that does not have you dwelling in the middle of their heart. They're not saved. Lord, might today be the day that they invite you in so that you can dwell in the midst of them forever. Lord, would you bring us back tonight, please, hungry, ready to hear more from you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.